Alrighty, so this is our scrubs video for the anterior medial thigh. Um, starting off with our mission statement, scrubs mission statement, again, y'all know is student-driven initiative that's aiming to develop supplemental resources for current and future cohort of cell cast Brody. And we participate in a variety of subcommittees that work on creating these resources for students by students. Um, hopefully, if this is something that aligns with your own goals, you will uh, consider joining us in the future. Brief disclaimer, um, it is important to note that these student are these are student derived resources and as such there is the possibility for error. We do work try to mitigate these via a team approach. Um, but if you do notice any errors or anything that does not correspond with your primary course materials, please go off of the material that you are instructed to use as primary course material for the course. So Getting started with the anterior medial thigh, the first thing that we needed to think about is think about the bony landmarks of the region. Um, this is going to help us inform origins, insertions, as well as some of the actions of the muscles we'll be talking about. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the pelvic bone. Um, so we know that we have the sacrum in the back, that is joint, we have the sacroiliac joint where the ilium comes to meet the sacrum. As we move in anteriorly, we are going to have our pubis. And then we are going to have our um, ilium down here in the back. I'm sorry, ischium down here in the back. Um, so the big components that we need to know are sacrum. Then over here, we're going to have our ilium. And then down here, we're going to have our ischium. Um, now, specific landmarks that you want to know uh, for the anterior medial thigh that you're going to see as the origin insertion for different muscles is up here at the top of the ilium, so this bone here, we have an anterior superior iliac spine. Anterior superior iliac spine. You should remember this from um, when you were learning about the inguinal triangle and inguinal ligaments. The inguinal ligament rises from the anterior superior iliac spine and comes down to the pubic tubercle down here. So that's going to be where your inguinal ligament is going to be. Um, then a little bit more inferiorly, we have our anterior inferior iliac spine. Which again, important to note, anterior inferior iliac spine. Ischial spine back here in the back, which we can see better from a posterior view, and the ischial tuberosity down here. Okay, so ischial tuberosity. The other things that you need to know is right here we have the inferior pubic ramus, superior pubic ramus. You'll see that a lot of the muscles that we're talking about from the adductor compartment are going to arise from this region here. All right, so um, if this is, I know that was a brief overview. But um, it would be beneficial for you to make sure that you have the bony landmarks down first before you go into um, identifying the origin insertions of various muscles. Also important to know, we need to think about the femur. The femur is the long bone of the thigh. So the femur has a couple of really important landmarks that um, are tested. So what I want to point out here is we have an anterior view and a posterior view of the femur. There are two names that get confused by students pretty frequently. On the anterior surface, in between the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter, we have an intertrochanteric line. So the intertrochanteric line is in the front of the femur. In the back, between the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter, we have an intertrochanteric crest. So this is on the posterior side. So one of the ways that I remember this um, is I think crest in the back, like my crack. Like crest for crack. Okay, so your butt crack is in the posterior aspect of your body. So intertrum cateric crest, posterior aspect of the femur. Now, you ask yourself, how do I identify the anterior versus posterior aspect of the femur um, if I'm just giving this bone in lab? Well, the thing that we're going to be looking for is this uh, line right down the middle of the posterior aspect of the femur. That's going to be called the linear aspera. And we're going to see that this is going to be the insertion for a lot of the muscles we talk about today. Right, and then so greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, here's a trochanteric neck, um, or the neck of the femur, and then right here we have the head of the femur. Now as we come distally on the medial aspect of the femur, we're going to have the adductor tubercle. It makes sense that this would be on the medial aspect because again, um, adduction is going to bring our legs in. So in order for that to happen, we would have to have the insertion on the medial aspect of the leg. Okay, and then we have a lateral epicondyle and medial epicondyle. Okay, so actually getting into the muscles of the thigh, um, we're going to start with the muscles of the anterior thigh. And what I want to point out is the muscles of the anterior thigh are all innervated by the femoral nerve. Okay, so all the muscles of the anterior leg, or sorry, anterior thigh, are going to be innervated by the femoral nerve. And it's important that I go ahead and mention there is a difference between the term thigh and leg. 
value is going to return or it's going to refer to your um, extremities in between your hip and your knee. So we're just talking about the thigh here. So what are the muscles that are um, components of the anterior thigh? Well, let's start with the sartorius. Sartorius is this muscle that comes across from the ASIS, the anterior superior iliac spine, and comes down towards the medial aspect of the knee. Okay, so it starts at the ASIS and comes down medially in a diagonal motion to insert into the medial aspect of the tibia. And specifically, the uh, structure that it's inserting into is going to be called the pes inserine. Okay, inserting down here in the tibia. Now, the action of this muscle, when it flexes, think about shortening this muscle. So we're bringing the tibia, the medial aspect of the tibia, closer to the lateral aspect of the hip. It's going to abduct. So we're abducting, flexing the hip, and we're going to laterally rotate at the thigh. So the overall motion of this muscle flexing is that of a hack, um, hacky sack. So if you drop a hacky sack in front of you and try to kick it up with the side of your foot, that's going to be the same motion as the sartorius contracting. Next, we have our iliopsoas. Our iliopsoas is made up of two muscles. There's the iliacus, which is this muscle that sits on the interior aspect of the ilium. So it sits right here on this bone here. And then we have our so as major. So so as major coming down, and that is going to come down here into our um, thigh. So the iliopsoas, again, iliac fossa and lumbar vertebrae, its insertion is onto the lesser trochanter. So remember back to our femur, we have a greater trochanter and lesser trochanter. The insertion here is the lesser trochanter. And this is the primary flexor of the hip. So your iliopsoas is the primary flexor of the hip. It comes down and it's going to insert into the lesser trochanter, and it's going to be the primary flexor of the hip. Next, we go into our um, quad muscles. So our quad muscles, we're going to start with the rectus femoris. The rectus femoris is this thin band that comes straight up. The Actually, it's not on this image. It is this one here. Rectus femoris is the one right on top. It is going to originate from the AIIS. That is the anterior inferior iliac spine. It's important for you to know this because on radiology, we can point to that landmark and ask you what structure uh, originates from this um, landmark and you would say that's the rectus femoris. So the rectus femoris is going to come down and it's going to in, um, join with the other quad muscles into the quadriceps tendon and then it's eventually going to uh, insert onto the tibia and that's going to be your patellar tendon um, and this m primary uh, action is going to be to extend the knee however because it does cross the hip joint right across the hip joint here it does have the ability to flex the thigh. So this is the only uh, quadricep muscle that can also act on the hip because it can it crosses that hip joint. Now, the next two is going to be the vastus medialis and vastus lateralis. That is, here's your vastus medialis here. So it's on the medial aspect and vastus lateralis coming over here. Now, both of these are going to arise from the linea aspera, which was that groove in the back of the femur. And then again, the quadricep tendon is going to be um, com a combination of all of your vastus muscles and rectus femoris. And then it's going to become the patellar uh, tendon or patellar ligament after you cross over the patella, which is your kneecap, and insert onto the tibia. And the primary mechanism here is to extend the knee. Lastly, we have the vastus intermedialis. This sits underneath the rectus femoris. So in this image here, the rectus femoris has been removed and we can see that there's a muscle underneath. That is your vastus intermedialis. The origin here is the anterior and lateral aspect of the femoral shaft. So over here in this region, and it again inserts onto the tibia um, via the quadriceps tendon and its primary action is going to be the extended knee. So the big thing you want to think about here, um, the muscles of the anterior thigh, we have the iliopsoas, sartorius, we have the rectus femoris, which is right here, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and underneath all of these is the vastus intermedialis. And these are going to be all innervated by the femoral nerve, which has spinal segments L2 through L4. So that was the muscles of the anterior thigh. Now we need to think about a separate compartment. Here we're going to be thinking about the muscles of the medial thigh. So. I want to go ahead and start off by saying the muscles of the medial thigh are going to be innervated by the obturator nerve. Okay, the obturator nerve, and if you remember going back to our lumbosacral plexus video, um, there are two components of the obturator nerve. There's an anterior component and a posterior component. 
So the pathway of the obturator nerve is it's going to pass through the obturator foramen, which is located here in the pelvis. And as it's coming down, it's going to find the obturator brevis, which is this muscle highlighted here. And it's going to split over top of the obturator brevis. One part is going to go anterior to the obturator brevis. That is the anterior obturator division. And then one component is going to go posterior to the obturator brevis. Sorry, adductor brevis. Um, that is going to be the posterior component of the obturator nerve. All right, so now going through the muscles. We're going to start from uh, laterally and work our way medially. First, we have the pectineus. The pectineus is the most superficial of these. That's the most lateral. It is arising from the superior pubic ramus and inserting into the pectineal line, the pectineal line of the femur. Another thing that you can see is there is a pectinate line um, on the uh, pubic bone, um, and it's on the superior pubic ramus specifically. Uh, so you could see that the origin is the pectinate line and the insertion is the pectinate line, depending on um, what resource you're using. But just know that one is referring to the pubis, one is referring to the femur. Okay, the action of this muscle is going to be to adduct and flex the thigh. You'll notice that most of these muscles are going to have the function of adducting the, uh, the thigh, meaning that we're going to take it from laterally and bring it medially. Okay, that makes sense when we think about the origin and insertion. Next up, we've got the gracilis. So we had this long strap muscle in the anterior compartment of our leg, or sorry, of our thigh. That was the sartorius. Now, if we look more medially, we have this long muscle that comes down and inserts into the same region. This is going to be our gracilis. The gracilis originates from the inferior pubic ramus, and it's going to insert onto the medial aspect of the tibia, again in the same location as the sartorius, and that's going to be the pes anserines. And the important part about the pes is it's actually three tendons arising or joining together at a single location. We'll talk about all three of those in a moment. And the function of this muscle is going to be the adductor thigh, no shock there, as well as flexion. Why do we have flexion? Because it crosses the hip joint. Right. And then we're going to have medial rotation of the leg. So if you're thinking about the motion that the gracilis does, imagine that you're kicking your heel backwards up and out. Okay, So the opposite of the uh, hacky sack motion that you did with the sartorius. Next, we have our adductor brevis. Our adductor brevis is going to be located right here. Oftentimes, it's a little bit hard to see um, without other dissections because the adductor longus sits on top of it. So we have our adductor longus here, and then underneath it is our adductor brevis, which we can see in this deeper dissection. The adductor brevis is going to originate from the inferior pubic ramus, and it's going to insert onto the linea aspera. And then again, you're starting to get a theme, it is going to adduct and flex the thigh. Next we have our adductor longus. This is arising from the pubic body, so right here. And then as it comes down, it is then going to insert into the medial linea aspera. And then again, adduction and flexion of the thigh. Great news, all of these muscles we talked about so far are innervated by the anterior division of the obturator nerve. And that nerve sits specifically on top of the obturator brevis muscle. Sorry, adductor brevis muscle. Next, we have our two muscles back here that are innervated by the posterior division of the obturator nerve. That is going to be the adductor magnus and the obturator externus. So the adductor magnus is this big flat muscle that is actually a little bit hard to see. It's underneath the brevis here. It's this muscle right there that comes down. So that is our adductor magnus. It is pretty far um, posteriorly. It has a horizontal component and a vertical component. The one that we're talking about here is the horizontal component. Um, the horizontal component is innervated by the posterior division of the obturator nerve. So it's going to arise from the obturator membrane or femoral border and it's going to insert into, oh sorry, wrong muscle. It's going to arise from the issue of pubic ramus and ischial tuberosity. And then this adductor component is going to insert into the linea aspera. So it comes from over here and inserts into the back of the femur. And this main action is going to be to adduct the thigh. Now I mentioned that there are some vertical components, some vertical fibers. That is actually going to insert into the adductor tubercle as opposed to inserting into the linea aspera, um, which is, again, if you think back to the bones that we looked at earlier, the adductor tubercle is down here near the medial aspect of the knee. And its primary action is going to be to flex the thigh. And, um, sorry, its primary action is going to be to extend the thigh when we're talking about those vertical components. The flexion is going to come from the adduction components. Now, we're going to have the obturator externus. 
is our last muscle. The obturator externus is um, originating from the obturator uh, foramen, the borders of that on the external side of the pelvis. And it's going to be coming around the back of the uh, femur, and it's going to insert into the greater trochanter, so the back side of this greater trochanter. So when it contracts, imagine that this greater trochanter is getting closer to the um, obturator foramen. And when that happens, we're going to get rotation, specifically lateral rotation. So we're originating from here, coming behind the femur, inserting into the greater trochanter. And if you contract, then you're going to get rotation. And this is going to be lateral rotation. Important with lateral rotation, uh, make sure that you know the difference between lateral and medial rotation because it's going to be very important to think about the action of the hip versus at the ankle. Okay, so um, two things that are really important in terms of uh, the information that is going to be presented on the exam is the femoral triangle and the adductor canal. So this goes into borders and contents, um, things that you know that they love to test. So we're going to start with the femoral triangle. Femoral triangle, again, triangle, has three borders. We're going to start with our lateral border over here. And this lateral border is our sartorius muscle. So here is that sartorius muscle, again, arising from the ASIS, coming down towards the pes serine, which is down on the medial aspect of the tibia. And that is going to form our medial border of the femoral triangle. Our next border is something they should be well familiar with at this point. This is going to be our inguinal ligament, our inguinal ligament coming down, forming the superior border. So this is a superior medial border of the adductor triangle, or sorry, the femoral triangle. Now over here, down here at the bottom, this is going to be our adductor longus muscle. So adductor longus muscle here, and that is forming the medial inferior border of our femoral triangle. So now we have this nice little triangle here. What I want to point out is that the femoral triangle is going to have a couple of different structures. Okay, If we go from lateral to medial, it is going to go nerve, artery, vein. One way to remember this is the mnemonic navel, nerve, artery, vein, and then also we're going to have empty space followed by lymphatics. Okay, so the contents of the um, femoral triangle are the femoral nerve, femoral artery, femoral vein, empty space, and then you have lacunar ligament slash um, uh, lymphatics. Now the skin above the femoral triangle. So specifically the skin above the femoral triangle is going to be um, from the femoral branch of the genitofemoral nerve. So if someone has a loss of sensation just over this region, you're going to say that's the genitofemoral nerve, which remember has spinal segments L1 through L2. The second thing that I want to point out is um, we do have a ring, femoral ring, that comes down here to get into the femoral triangle. And you'll see when we talk about clinical correlations, it is possible for a hernia or a part of the bowel that come through this ring into the femoral triangle. Now, the second thing we want to talk about is the adductor canal. The adductor canal is really just a continuation of the pathway for um, these vessels. So the vessels have to go somewhere and they're going to run inferiorly. So as we look at the adductor canal, we now have different borders. The different borders of the adductor canal is on top, we have the sartorius, which has been cut away from this image. So the sartorius was running down it was a border of my femoral triangle. Now it's going to be the anterior border of my femoral canal because it's going to sit right on top of where my arrow is pointing now. Okay, so there goes the sartorius as the anterior border. Medially, we have this muscle, which is my vastus medialis. Okay, so the medial border, or sorry, actually this will be a lateral border if we're thinking anatomically. We've got our vastus medialis. And then over here on the medial aspect, we're going to have my adductor longus and my adductor magnus. So adductor longus and adductor magnus coming through here. And eventually what will happen is um, there's going to be a split of the adductor magnus. Remember it has vertical fibers and horizontal fibers. And where that split occurs, there's actually a little hiatus or a little hole that allows these vessels to run into the back of the knee and specifically into the back of the popliteal fossa, which is the space behind the knee. So the femoral artery comes down or the femoral vein it enters into the femoral triangle, then it continues through the adductor canal, which has the borders of the sartorius anteriorly, vastus medialis laterally in anatomical position, and then with the adductor magnus and adductor longus um, medially. And then eventually those vessels will exit through the adductor hiatus, which is just the splitting of the vertical versus horizontal fibers of the um, adductor magnus. Now that gives you the borders of the canal, 
but we also need to know what is in the canal. This is where you're likely to be tested. So we mentioned that we have the femoral artery, the femoral vein, but then we have some nerves. And what we need to know is we don't have all of the nerves um, that are present in the uh, from the femoral nerve, right? Because some of those have already innervated muscles. So there's just two that we need to keep up with. We need to know this nerve right here that is coming down to innervate this muscle on the lateral aspect of the adductor, or adductor canal. This is going to be the vastus medialis. So that nerve right there is the nerve to vastus medialis. And then we have this other nerve. This other nerve kind of runs, it runs with the vessels, and then all of a sudden, as the vessels dive down behind the knee, this nerve comes out along the outside, or the medial aspect of my knee. So it comes out medial aspect, and this is actually going to end up running down towards uh, the medial aspect of your foot with the saphenous vein, the great saphenous vein, which comes down here. So this is going to be called your saphenous nerve. So the contents we need to know is a saphenous nerve, the nerve of the vastus medialis, and the femoral artery and vein are running through the adductor canal. Now we've been mentioning these nerves pretty frequently, and we covered these in a little bit more detail when we were talking about the lumbosacral plexus, but let's talk a little bit about the nerves of the anterior medial thigh. Let's start with the femoral nerve. Remember the femoral nerve comes off of the posterior division of the lumbar plexus, and it has spinal segments L234. So it comes off the femoral nerve and runs down, and then it is going to give off the saphenous nerve, the nerve of vastus medialis, muscular branches that hit the rest of the muscles, and then cutaneous branches. So we can actually see that better in this image. So here goes the femoral nerve coming down. It's giving off a bunch of uh, muscular branches, but the ones that we need to keep up with as we continue down inferiorly is the saphenous nerve. We see that coming around towards the medial aspect of my foot. And then we've got this nerve here going to the vastus medialis, going through the adductor canal. So that gives me my femoral nerve. And we've already mentioned all the muscles that this innervates, but really all the muscles in the anterior compartment of the thigh are gonna get innervation from the femoral nerve. Next, we have the obturator nerve. Obturator nerve is, again, spinal segments L2 through 4, but now it's off the anterior division as opposed to the posterior division of the lumbar plexus. And we mentioned that it has an anterior component and a posterior component. So here we go, obturator nerve, again, coming off of L2 through 4. It comes down. It runs through the um, obturator foramen. And right here, you can see that there's a fiber that goes posterior. There's a fiber that goes anterior. And this is going on either side of your adductor brevis. So that adductor brevis muscle is located right here. So that post, that um, portion that goes behind the adductor brevis is the posterior division of the obturator nerve. And again, that is innervating your obturator externus, which is this muscle here, as well as your adductor magnus, which is located posteriorly. And then everything else is innervated in the adductor compartment of the leg via the anterior division of the obturator nerve. Now, when we talk about cutaneous innervation of the lower limb, it can get a little bit um, complicated, but we really just want to think about this in regions. So the main thing is we already indicated the skin over the femoral triangle is going to be innervated by the femoral branch of the genitofemoral nerve. Okay, so the femoral branch of the genitofemoral nerve. Up here, more laterally and superiorly, this is your lateral cutaneous branch, right? And then down here, your lateral cutaneous femoral nerve. And again, look back to the lumbosacral plexus. Um, this is one of the components of the lumbar plexus. Everything else, the anterior cutaneous branches of the femoral nerve, and you're going to have medial branches. Um, these are all coming off of the femoral nerve itself. And then we have some cutaneous branches of the obturator nerve. Now, the one thing that I do want to point out is right here, you have your great saphenous vein. Down here is joined by the saphenous nerve. And that runs down to the medial aspect of the heel. So this region here, this medial aspect of your lower limb is going to be from the saphenous nerve. So this is the cutaneous innervation of the lower limb. Now, one thing that I uh, often find is difficult for students is thinking about the vasculature that supplies this region. So the big thing that we're going to point out is the different branches of the iliacs as they're running distally and um, kind of how the vessels flow down towards the foot. The main thing we want to point out is the abdominal aorta branches into our common iliacs which eventually branch a little bit more distally into your internal iliacs and external iliacs. What we're going to be thinking about here is following our external iliac branches. So the external iliac comes through, and it switches names from the external iliac to the femoral artery when it crosses underneath the inguinal ligament. 
Remember the inguinal ligament runs from the ASIS to the pubic tubercle here. So imagine there's a ligament running over top. It's going to switch from external iliac to femoral. Now, any branch that comes off before the external iliac switches to the femoral is going to be have the term deep involved. So this one here that's not labeled, this would be your um, deep circumflex iliac. And here we have our inferior epigastric. But then once we get underneath the inguinal ligament, which would be around in here, we're going to name or put the term superficial in front of things. So now we have our superficial circumflex iliac. We have our superficial epigastric. And then here we have our external pudendal artery. Okay, And the difference here is there would be an internal pudendal artery as well. But because this is coming off after the inguinal ligament, then we're going to have this as external or superficial. So those are the three superficial branches of the um, femoral artery that you need to know. The superficial circumflex iliac, superficial epigastric, and the external pudendal artery. Now, one thing that I want to point out, um, as we come distally, we are then going to get a profunda branch. The profunda branch is going to run posteriorly. So that's this branch here that runs down towards the back of the uh, femur. The profunda branch is going to dive between two muscles on its way to the back of the thigh. It is going to pass between the adductor longus and the pectineus muscle. So where the pectineus muscle comes across like this, and the adductor longus sits a little bit more posteriorly coming down towards the, um, the linea asperunga leg. So that is where you have this vessel here, the profunda branch of the um, femoral artery. And in the hospital, you may hear someone say superficial femoral artery, which is your main femoral artery coming down, or you may hear someone say deep femoral artery. And if they say deep femoral, they're talking about the profunda femoral artery. Now, as we go through the different components of the profunda femoral artery, um, that's really where things get a little bit more confusing. Off of the profunda femoral artery, we're going to have a lateral and a medial circumflex femoral artery. So lateral circumflex femoral coming around the outsides and a medial circumflex femoral coming more medially. The medial circumflex doesn't give off any name branches you need to know. It's just going to be medial circumflex. But it, the lateral circumflex gives off some other branches that we do have to know the name for. So lateral circumflex coming around. And then you see that there is a ascending branch going towards uh, the greater trochanter. There is a transverse branch wrapping around the, the shaft. And then there is a descending branch coming down around the lateral aspect of the femur. So... The lateral circumflex femoral artery gives off an ascending branch, transverse branch, and descending branch. And here we can see a posterior view up near the hip. I do want to point out that there are multiple vessels that join to supply the hip, and this is going to be called the cruciate anastomosis, and it's really supplying the femoral head. Here you have your medial circumflex femoral artery. This is doing the primary um, majority of the blood supply. The profunda femoral artery will give off a branch that comes up, this first perforating artery, that can um, help supply the fem femur. And you have your lateral circumflex femoral artery. And this is the transverse and ascending branch. We also have a couple of other branches, such as our inferior gluteal artery, which you see here, then come down and contribute to the cruciate anastomosis as well. Okay, now, um, just talking about venous supply real quick. There's really one thing that I need you to know. Um, in the region of the femoral triangle, right, we have fascia that covers all of our muscular, all of our musculature, but there is a hole in the middle of the vasculature in the region of the femoral triangle, and that is called our saphenous opening. So right here we have our saphenous opening, and through that opening we have a vein that comes out. This is called our great saphenous vein. So it's coming out of the saphenous opening, and it's going to come down run around the medial aspect of the leg all the way to the medial aspect of the foot. So this is our great saphenous vein. And once you get to the knee, it's going to be joined by the saphenous nerve, which is a branch of our femoral nerve. And here you see that it's coming down and it's going all the way to contributing to the dorsal venous arch of the foot. Uh, now, not as important, just so you know, um, when you're looking at the vasculature of the leg, usually you're going to have an artery that is sur surrounded by the veins. Um, and You'll mostly see that in lab, but that's not something that I would expect you to be tested on. All right, and then lastly, um, you'll hit this more when we get into the leg, but in the posterior aspect, so here's the knee. Once we get um, through the popliteal fossa, which is the area behind the knee, 
you're going to have the small saphenous vein running down the posterior aspect of your leg. Okay, that takes us through the majority of the um, pushback chapter, but now let's talk a little bit about the clinical anatomy. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is a pulled groin. Um, this can really just happen in sports that require starts and stops, uh, like sprinting or in stretching. And so really what you need to know here is just what are the uh, muscles of the groin, and specifically this is referring to the muscles of the adductor canal. So going through these again, um, we kind of talked about these, but here's a deeper dissection. Here we have the uh, external obturator or obturator externus. This is innervated by the posterior division of your obturator nerve. And then right here, you have your adductor brevis. Remember the adductor brevis is where you're having the nerve split anteriorly and posteriorly to give you the different divisions of the obturator nerve. Right here in five, this is going to be your adductor magnus. And again, this is a deeper dissection, so we had the abductor um, longus removed. That is actually this muscle here in six. And then right here we have the gracilis coming down. Now something this image does pretty well is if you look back here, um, you can see in number five that we have horizontal fibers coming down to the linear aspera, and we have vertical fibers coming down to the adductor tubercle. And in between that, we have a hole. This hole here is the adductor hiatus that we were talking about previously. And that's really formed by the splitting fibers of the horizontal component of your adductor magnus, which is innervated by the posterior component of the obturator nerve, and then you have your vertical fibers. And I didn't mention this earlier, but the vertical fibers are going to be innervated by a separate nerve. Um, it has split innervation, and that is specifically going to be innervated by a component of your sciatic nerve, your tibial nerve. So the vertical components are innervated by the tibial nerve, which is one of the components of your sciatic nerve. We'll cover that in a little bit more detail when we do the uh, muscles of the posterior aspect of the thigh. The last muscle that has split innervation that I did not mention earlier is the pectineus here. It's the pectineus label number two. Um, it has split innervation by your anterior component of the obturator nerve as well as the femoral nerve. That makes sense because it is the most medially, or sorry, most laterally located of all of these muscles. And we know our femoral nerve is doing everything in the flexor compartment. Um, so it makes sense that uh, if one of these muscles is going to have split innervation with the femoral nerve, it will be the pect um, pectineus because it's located in closest approximation to the rest of the muscles that are innervated by the femoral nerve. Now, something that I want to point out is the patellar reflex. The patellar reflex is when we take our reflex hammer and we're hitting the patella tendon. And this is going to send um, sensory information back through the dorsal root ganglion. So remember, sensory information goes to the dorsal root ganglion. And then we're going to send an excitatory fiber down through the, or an afferent fiber, or sorry, afferent fiber, E, with an E, is going to go through our ventral root. And then that's going to go to the muscle causing contraction. Now, whenever we have contraction of one muscle, we also need to inhibit its antagonist. So you're actually going to see that we're going to have an inhibitory fiber come down and inhibit the action of our hamstring muscles. So that way we get an unimpeded reflex. So this is why the patellar reflex works. And what we really need to know is what spinal segments are we testing? We're testing the femoral nerve. Um, and so this is testing for femoral nerve injury. So that's going to be L3 through 4. I know that the femoral nerve has spinal segments L2 through 4, but the patellar reflex specifically is testing L3 through 4 spinal segment levels. Now, another thing that we need to think about is uh, placement of a femoral venous catheter. When we're looking for a venous catheter, how would you go about this? We can't see the vein underneath the skin unless we're using ultrasound. So how can I do this without needing an ultrasound machine? Well, one thing that I can do is I can feel for a pulse with a femoral artery. And once I feel for the femoral artery pulse, I can then decide in what direction compared to the femoral artery do I need to go to place a needle into the vein. So for me, remember our navel mnemonic, nerve, artery, vein, empty space, lymphatic slash lacunar ligament. We know that the vein is located more medially than the femoral artery. So what we'll do is we'll feel for the femoral artery and then we'll go just medial to that and we'll put in our catheter. Okay, last thing here, we need to think about a femoral hernia. Um, the big thing that I want to point out here is what spaces does the femoral hernia pass through? So the femoral hernia comes through up here underneath the inguinal ligament through a ring. And this ring isn't really visualized in this image very well, but that is going to be the uh, femoral ring. 
which is up here located more superiorly. Then if it comes down far enough, it can go through the saphenous opening with our great saphenous nerve coming down to supply the medial aspect of our leg. And now it is passed through the saphenous opening into the femoral triangle. It's so a big thing here. We're passing through the femoral ring into the femoral triangle. And if it's bad enough, we'll pass through the saphenous opening as well. Okay, should be our last thing here. This is the arterial supply to the femoral head. We've already mentioned this um, to a degree, but I like this image a lot. Uh, this is talking about our cruciate anastomosis. So our cruciate anastomosis is supplying a lot of the blood to our femoral head. We have our medial circumflex artery. So our medial circumflex artery is going to be this one, number three, coming around. You see our fancy little label here. This is supplying the majority of the blood supply to the femoral head. Next, we have the ascending branch of our lateral circumflex artery right here, as long, along with our transverse branch. And then not really visualized is an inferior gluteal artery that's coming down. And then we have um, a perforating branch of our profunda brachial, sorry, profunda femoral artery, uh, which isn't really visualized well, be coming off here and running up. And then we have this acetabular branch. And this is going to the, the head of the femur just to supply that region. Um, it may be mentioned in the course back, but I just think it's important to know as well. So these are really the areas that we have to worry about. Um, the reason we talk about the cruciate anastomosis is because it's really important that we have blood supply to the femur. If one of these vessels is disrupted, then there's the potential for a watershed zone to form where we're not getting a lot of blood supply. Um, so that should take us through the end of this video.